the GDPR gives controllers, data controllers, very broad audit rights when it comes to contracting with their vendors or processors. So then when we, once we discuss the scope of the data breach, it's time to also discuss with them what regulatory notifications they, they have to comply with. Yes, you cannot isolate. When you have a data breach, you cannot just focus on your legal regulatory obligations. Hello, everyone. I'm Sergio Maldonado, and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy, and technology with a clear goal in mind, which is redefining the relationship between people, brands, and media around transparency and control which is to say we're aiming for real customer centricity or if you will, human centricity. We regularly talk to DPOs, CMOs, CDOs, and whoever else we find interesting and able to share valuable insights. So we hope you like it. Please do reach out if you have any ideas on future topics or speakers. We have Yves-Christi Vermink here today. She is a dual admitted lawyer, both in civil law and common law, working at Scadden Arps, the law firm, and advising clients on cybersecurity, privacy, IT, IP, blockchain, and related topics like even NFTs or Web3 compliance. She is also a member of the Data Law Committee at the City of London Law Society. With Yves-Christi, we're going to discuss the specific practical steps when it comes to dealing with personal data breaches in the UK or the EU. Let's get started. If Christy, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you for having me. So first of all, what is meant by a personal data breach under the GDPR or the UK GDPR? It's worth reminding people that it is a very broad definition, which is defined as follows. It's a breach of security leading to the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, but also alteration, unauthorized disclosure of or access to personal data that are transmitted, stored, or otherwise processed. There are three types of personal data breaches, confidentiality, integrity and availability. And just to give a few examples of what those are. So confidentiality is around the unauthorized disclosure or access to personal data. So for instance, very recently, Twitter in January, 2023, had their email addresses of more than 200 million Twitter users posted on an online, online sorry, hacking forum. And the hacker had demanded $200,000 to return the data, and that was back in December 2022. And they had warned Twitter that if their conditions were not fulfilled, they will not release the data for free. Um, and so that's what they did. Yeah, The hacker claimed to have collected the data by using a data uh, scraping technique and now patch vulnerability in Twitter's software. So that's an example of confidentiality. But you also have integrity breach, and that's more the unauthorized or accidental alteration of personal data. So for instance, you have your you know, social media accounts, whichever it is, and this one is hacked and your password and other details are changed by someone else who is now using your accounts on your behalf. And then the last one is availability breach. And that's more around the unauthorized loss of access or the destruction of personal data. So for instance, you have a decryption key that is lost for an encrypted data set. So you can no longer have access to that data set. And another topical example is the Royal Mail. So again, in January, 2023, Royal Mail was hit by a ransomware attack that hits um, their systems that produce the documentation needed to send items internationally, which obviously is not welcome news for them. So Royal Mail was unable to send parcels and letters internationally for two full weeks. And customers are still being warned against sending uh, parcels abroad. So the operational impact is see, still being felt uh, with a huge uh, backlog. And sometimes all those three types of breaches intermingle 
And it's very difficult to say whether it's only an availability breach or an integrity breach or a confidentiality because it might as well be all three together. Okay, so it could be one of these scenarios. I am being blackmailed or someone has reported that they lost a laptop that wasn't encrypted or something happened. And we know we have lots of records out there and we'll start pondering. What do we do? And the first thing they do is they call you. So, and that's exactly the way it starts. Usually it's, it's a phone call. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's a broad question because you have different things that come into play. First of all, when you get this phone call, you also want to know what the company has in place. Because usually, and again, that is a requirement of the GDPR, they should have an incident response team together with an incident response plan. So when they call you on the back of that, there are quite a lot of things happening. So you all also want to sense check what is effectively happening on the ground. So who is their response, incident response team? Is it cross-functional? Does it include someone from their IT team? Is their chief information security officer involved? Do they have some form of escalation route to share any findings with senior management, the boards? So are they all kind of on the same page? Um, where are they in terms of the scoping? Because that's the first question that we will ask. You know, have you scoped the, the ramifications of your breach? Because then we have to assess quite a number of things. Is it, has it happened only in one country or is it international? What data are we talking about? The types of data, but also the volume of data. And, you know, what type of attack is it? You know, is it integrity? Is it availability? Is it confidentiality? What are the operational kind of outcome of, of the crisis? And so that's how we start working together. And so they'll give us, you know, of course, the outcome of, you know, what they have discussed within their incident response team and, you know, the way also they are dealing with it because they have a step plan usually in accordance with their incident response plan. So then when we, once we discuss the scope of the data breach, it's time to also discuss with them what regulatory notifications they, they have to comply with. So what are the different notification requirements for a personal data breach? So you have one that is where the controllers are required to notify the competent supervisor authority or authorities, depending uh, on the facts at, at hand, without a new delay. And in any event, within 72 hours of becoming aware of a personal data breach. And that is as soon as they become aware of it. So there are no like weekend bank holidays and so on. It starts when it starts. If it's the middle of a Saturday, it will be the middle of a Saturday. And um, there, it's important as well to have some form of risk-based approach. Because the threshold, which is a very binary threshold, is to say, whether this breach is likely to result in a risk to the rights and freedoms of those affected individuals. Has there been a risk or has there been no risk at all? So at the very beginning of the GDPR, companies tended to over-report because even minor breaches, they thought, fine, it will be caught by this very kind of binary threshold and let's go about and, and notify. Now, I think it's in, in the meantime, it's fair to say supervisor authorities, they don't have enough manpower and they've been fairly vocal about pushing companies to undertake some form of internal risk analysis before making the decision you know, that a breach is, is reportable. So what does becoming aware of mean? Obviously, this is a critical point given that it triggers that 72-hour window. So becoming aware is when the controller has confirmed that a security incident has occurred that has led to personal data being compromised, for instance, access by a threat actor. But sometimes this confirmation is not possible, depending on the facts. So then you have to turn to, is it enough that the controller has a reasonable degree of certainty that personal data has been compromised? So for instance, if a company receives a ransom note from a threat actor, that would not per se trigger the 72 hour period. But the controller may undertake a short period of investigation to see whether the breach has occurred. And then if they reach that level of reasonable degree of certainty that the data has been accessed or even more exfiltrated, 
that you know that's when kind of the 72 hour window kicks if you haven't done so um you know you, you can take a a phased approach to say, okay, well, we, we were, you know, deep into an initial investigation. So, and, you know, potentially the becoming aware threshold was not that easy to reach. So, you know, you can, first of all, initiate dialogue with the competent supervisor authorities by way of an initial notification and letting them know that internally you're working on it. And as soon as you find out more, and usually that's around really the scoping of the um, cybersecurity incidents, you'll get back to them with further information. And by the way, that will not prevent the supervisor authorities, if they so wish, to come back to you in the meantime, once they receive this initial notification and say, okay, oh, well, it's good, but you know, actually we've got a few follow-up questions. And then you'll have to obviously respond, you know, promptly to those follow-up uh, queries. But that again, does not prevent you from further down the line once you've done done the scoping, once you've contained the breach, once you've hopefully restored uh, you know the data to go back to them with kind of a more fulsome notification to let them know exactly you know what's the the journey of the of this incident and where you now land to give them reassurance that this is now closed at least from your side. And of course, if they want to ask further questions, they they always can. But that's kind of the of the journey. And what about the second notification requirement under the GDPR, UK GDPR? The second uh, regulatory notification under the GDPR is vis-a-vis uh, -vis those affected individuals. And that's a higher threshold because that is where it's likely to have resulted in a high risk to the rights and freedoms of the individuals. So you've got to be mindful as well that it's not just reporting to the relevant supervisor authorities, it might as well be at the same time in parallel reporting to the affected um, data subjects. And, and the content of those notifications are similar. It's around describing the nature of the breach, uh, you know, giving some form of contact detail of, of someone that is in charge of data protection at the company to the extent that either the supervisor authority or one of the affected subject wants to get in touch the likely consequences of the breach. So for instance, if there has been some business you know, disruption or interruption, you know, be transparent with your customers, for instance, to say, you know, we have gone through those business you know, interruption or disruption. You know, we are working uh, internally to make sure that this is quickly sorted and we can go back to you know, business as usual. And, and also give them a flavor of what measures you're taking to address uh, the breach. So, you know, those two notifications are going on in parallel. Okay, so then, how do you mitigate this? From a reputational point of view, can you, as a lawyer, help? Yes, you cannot isolate. When you have a data breach, you cannot just focus on your legal regulatory obligations. You also have to focus on your financial impact, and that is not just in the sense of administrative fines from you know the relevant supervisor authorities but also the impact on your business whether your business operations have been affected whether your, you, the, the trust and customers will put in your business has been impacted so you know a, a few tips here i think one when you are the victim of a cyber attack your incident response team should not be shy from one, ringing up you know, their external legal counsel, their lawyers, but not just. It's also building a good team around them with other cybersecurity specialists. Because when you th think about ransomware attack, well, now it's much better to have those cybersecurity specialists that are specialized in negotiating and bargaining with those ransom attacker to, to speak about exactly what data they have potentially stolen, the decryption key that we're going to try to obtain from them, negotiating the ransomware note, because that's also something that, you know, requires some skills. And then on the back of that, you also have those experts that come and help out your IT, your InfoSec team to make sure that, you know, data can be recovered, data can be restored, that you have up and running backup systems that hopefully will you know, enable you to 
have kind of on a mirror server some data that remain unimpacted to the extent you have that. And that's usually goes together with your business continuity and disaster recovery plan. And then you have other types of cyber forensics that will help you with data mining to help you assess exactly what files have been accessed. Because it's one thing of the attacker saying we've accessed everything, but it's another thing of you being you know, in the deep root of your organization together with those cyber specialists and verifying that what they are saying is true. And then when it comes to communications, it's obviously complying with your regulatory communications vis-a-vis -vis supervisor authorities, but also affected individuals, but do it in a way that is consistent and make sure that what you're saying is what is required under applicable European data protection laws when we speak about Europe or elsewhere in the world, but also that won't put you at risk of all of a sudden getting, I don't know how many follow-up requests from your affected individuals as well. So, you know, usually that's, that's why now, the link, the communication link with your customers, with your user database, for companies generally speaking, is not just by way of email or, or a text message or, you know, it's more like also on social media. So more often than not, companies that are hit by a cybersecurity incident, they will, to the extent their email system is not down, they will use all available means to let their customer know that they are on the case. And oftentimes that's by way of a message on a social media platform. So I wonder about the history of this, you know, the, the three principles of data security, the so-called Trinity or CIA, um, finally found their way into the data protection framework. But what's your perspective on that? Do you think that the GDPR is the natural place for data breaches? I think even prior to the GDPR, there was an obligation to report uh, personal data breaches, but I guess the financial consequences of it in terms of administrative fines were not the same. As we all know, we have a two-tier level now of fines that can go all the way up to 4% of your annual uh, worldwide turnover. So, you know, obviously that puts things in perspective. But something that the GDPR definitely puts at its core is security. And it's one of their core principles under Article 5, which is around the integrity and confidentiality of data. So I think companies should be aware that, and there are many different ramifications to this one principle of integrity and confidentiality, which is that companies are required to implement what is called appropriate technical and organizational measures. And I think that takes its importance in the context of a breach, because it's not just about technical, it's also organizational. So technical measures will have your cybersecurity tools, your endpoint detection and response tools, what your IT infosec team, your chief information security officer or CISO has put in place, the relevant you know, certifications that they're relying upon. Um, so that's one thing, but also then you need a team, you need organizational measures. And that takes the form of going back to a cybersecurity breach, having your incident response team in place. But the incident response team and the fact that it's a cross-functional uh, team of stakeholders will be key in the response to a, a crisis. And then that comes together as well with training, training your employees, one, regularly, but also sometimes in a targeted manner. You're not going to train your HR people the same way you train your IT people, the same way you train your marketing people when it comes to data breach and cybersecurity. Because on a daily basis, they'll be managing different data sets. And because of that, they'll need tailored you know, training. In terms of security measures, how can controllers manage their supply chain cyber risks? The GDPR gives controllers, data controllers, very broad audit rights when it comes to contracting with their vendors or processors. And I think controllers should not be shy to exercise this right um, as and when they see fit. And that is to manage their supply chain cyber-related risk, to regularly audit their suppliers and make sure that those suppliers are also on top of their data protection cybersecurity programs, as well as policies and certifications. 
Yeah, and I think that audit should be done at two stages. One, onboarding, because that's kind of one of the requirements of the GDPR to make sure that you know exactly who you are um, engaging at the start, but also exercise at any time during the life of a, of a contract with, the, with their vendors. So, you know, there's so many bullet plate data processing agreements these days where the data processor has more of a negotiating power have you found some friction as to how far they can take such auditing? Yeah, I mean, that's a fair point. Uh, I think it's one of the most heavily negotiated provisions in a data processing agreement. Um, so yeah, that's that's totally you know fair. You're right. When you're dealing with processors that are very well established uh, international organizations, they'll have you know ways to deal with what they're willing to give. Um, so so focusing on audits, what they will usually approach controllers with is to say, we are on top of our you know, data protection, cybersecurity program. We have the relevant certifications, et cetera. So as and when you wish to audit us, what we'll do to comply with this request is that we'll provide you with a copy of our existing certifications or the reports that we do on our own, whether internally or externally. And that's all well and good. Now, acting on the controller side, there is always a way to initiate some dialogue. And of course, it depends on the bargaining power. There are lots of, you know, and, and the type of data that you're going to also, you know, give in the hands of the, of the processor. But there is a way to, to tell the processor, okay, we get that, but the GDPR provides a right not just to audit, but also to inspect. And there is a difference between an audit and an inspection. And I think there's a way to tell them, yes, fine. When it comes to exercising our audit powers, we'll do it the way you wish, if we can't you know, get more, obviously. Um, however, when it relates to an inspection, and what is an inspection? It's something that comes on the back of a actual or suspected personal data breach or in the context of an investigation that is launched by a supervisor authority. And they do, as we all know, have very broad audit powers as well to come knocking on your door whenever they so wish. Then I think it's not fair for the processor to be totally um, kind of refusing to open up on, on that side because an inspection is kind of a, you know, a creature, a different type of creature. And you have to allow the controller to be able to deal with that. So I think that's the way I see it. Sometimes you, you know, if you can't really push the audit further, you can try, you know, dealing with it by way of, of the inspection. Very good. Any last tips that you want to give us? Well, yeah, in, in the sense of maybe key kind of takeaways, um, one should never under, underestimate their cyber readiness um, because, you know, it is one of the, primary source of concerns for companies. Um, you know, the UK Information Commissioner, John Edwards, recently warned companies that the biggest cyber risk is complacency, not hackers. Um, and then is, yes, to have, you know, your trusted advisors, including legal counsel around you, so that when the crisis hits, you know exactly who to contact very quickly. And then it's just a matter of, you know, going through each step in a kind of orderly way, uh, despite the kind of crisis that is surrounding uh, you know, the, the company and make sure that you know, prior to anything going public, there has been one, the intense response on top of it, uh, but also escalation to senior management board. They've got to be part of that decision-making process. Um, and prior to anything going public, of course, anything that is not going public, make sure you maintain privilege. Okay, so it's a bit like boarding a plane and they show you how to put on your vest in case of an emergency and you visualize the scenario even though it is not supposed to happen, but now you're ready. Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you, Sergio. You're welcome. Okay, that's all for today. And you will find some episode notes and links to our social channels on mastersofprivacy.com. Thank you for listening.